Shalom, Israel, Shalom, Shalom, Brother Nakwam, watching for Israel, coming back at you with these precepts. And another cold cut, giving, of course, our honor and our glory to Yahweh. Vashima Mashiach, Wamalak Yahushai. Double honors to the elect elders of the house of David that's been in this truth for decades and decades, patiently waiting for the second coming of Mashiach, Wamalak Yahushai. The hearty, mighty Shalom to all of the mighty men of the Most High God who are out in the highways and byways, pushing this truth, mad to find a ministry. Presenting their body as a living sacrifice and enduring all things for the elect's sake. Shalom, shalom. Shalom to all of the men that may not be out there in the highways and byways as of yet, but they're working on it. They're getting built up in the spirit. They're praying, they're fasting, they're studying. They're being diligent and abounding in the work of the Lord. Shalom, shalom. Shalom to all of the aqua out there, the sincere sisters out there, holding it down in the households, married and unmarried, reverend to their husbands, for those who may not have them. Those are attended, those attended upon the Lord without distraction, Shalom. Shalom to the ancient men, the children, and the rest of our nation scattered abroad throughout the four corners of the earth. Shalom to Yvette McKellar, uh, from Egypt to Israel, Don Israel, V.Y. McKellar, uh, to Puak, T. Sellers, Brother Azariah, Shalom King, D. Rivers, Shalom. Uh, love pious, every knee shall bow, sweet styles, divine in nature, Nigel Blends, Devash Branch, right? And everybody else tuning in, Richard Perez, Louis Fambro, Trey Johnson, right? Callaway T, everybody that will tune in, Lord willing through the spirit and power of Yahweh Bashmi Abashad, continuing the series of WFI Law School, right? I'm not sure how many more I'm going to do. Right, but the spirit is only kind of going to the law for the past uh, few weeks. The first, the previous uh, lesson, we went into the Nazarite vow, the secrets of that vow, going to the surface level understanding, then diving a little bit deeper to get some more uh, insight and share some more light on the different disciplinary actions of that vow. Right, we also went in time past into um, uh, sun dry laws and diverse commandments right, in the book of Deuteronomy, and now we're going to pick up in sexual misconduct, the Semitic marriage and the Torah, right? So where are our people, are? I'm going to just come out and say it, they're, they're deviants, man, right? Our, our women are whores, our men are, men are whores, man, right? You have uh, all these uh, um, sexual transformers, and you got rape going on amongst our people, and uh, illegitimate marriages, and bastards, and Men leaving the households and wives with three so-called baby fathers and men who uproot and leave and have one family somewhere in Chicago. Then they got they leave and they start another family somewhere in D.C. It's all types of madness, man. You got friends with benefits. You got uh, 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 buddies, if you understand what I'm saying. You got all types of madness going on, man. Jump off tricks, thoughts, right? Days of the week, side pieces. Side chicks, right? Uh, all types of uh, sneaky links and sexual misconduct and just outright fornication and madness, man, amongst our people. But there are laws on how to govern us as a people when it comes to not just your diet, right? Not just growing your beard out, not just eating a lamb on a Passover, but also how to conduct yourself amongst the opposite sex to conduct yourself. And marriage to conduct yourself when you have interest in a woman, when a woman has interest in you. Or you can't let the so-called white man govern you, man. He's into boyfriends, girlfriends, breakups, get back together, fiancés, closure. He has all types of madness and evil going on. Right? So let's let's go right into this, man. Right? Let's go first and foremost to the book of Romans, right? Chapter 12 and 2. And we're gonna die into this and I want to key in on a, um, a chapter a specific chapter today but first let's go to the classic right in Romans chapter 12 and 2 and be not conformed to this world but be a transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of the most high so we were taught how to deal with each other man and a woman or a woman and a man you were taught mainly by the so-called white man who influenced your family, right? Your father, your mother was had a heavy influence on your uncles and 
stepfathers and brothers to show you how to deal with what uh, how to deal with another woman right and i'm speaking from a man's perspective and eve you were taught by your mother and she was taught by her grandmother right her auntie and and they were all directly influenced by the so-called white man in the mind to know how to deal with each other man so we have to go back into the law and renew our mind according to what's righteous according to the works and practices of our forefathers and foremothers man right that there be no Madness going on in our communities, man. Baby fathers. Where is baby father at in the Bible? Side piece. Sneaky link. Freaking off. We gotta re we gotta get our mind right, man. You even got this stuff going on in Israel in the truth. You got this same spirit of fornication and madness in the truth and sexual misconduct. Like I said, you got brothers buying uh, uh, sisters Airbnbs. They've been court for two months, buying them a hotel, freaking off in some secret room. We gotta get it. We gotta get ourselves together, and then say, "Oh well, we're not married." You have women with multiple husbands. She's been in the truth for three three years. She done laid down with four different men and four different caps. Right? We have to be of the most high. Let's go to first John Salakia. Let's go to first John chapter four. Right? This is first John chapter four and verse four. Yea, are of the most high, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Yeah, people that are uh, in these clubs twerking. You got men popping women in bathroom stalls. You got women meeting guys going up to the hotel, right? Driving across the city to lay down with their favorite celebrity, going backstage with athletes and all types of weird bugged out madness going on. Brothels and prostitute houses. They are of the world. You got back page sites and different weird numbers that you could call late at night. I remember growing up, you used to have those uh, little commercials at night, man. Huh? Are you lonely? And he kind of gave you this whole rundown. 12 a.m., 1 a.m., and they got uh, a lewd phone numbers popping on the screen. That's up the world, man. Huh? You know, a man bowing down and getting on one knee, proposing to his wife or his, his future wife. That's up the world. Our, fa our forefathers didn't do that. Now you got women proposing to men. See, the, everything is backwards because everybody's of the world. Therefore, speak they of the world and the world heareth them. Right? We are of the most high. So either you're of the world or you are of God, of the most high. He that knoweth the most high heareth us. He that is not of the most high heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And these are the two main spirits on the earth right now. The spirits of truth or the spirit of truth, rather, which is the spirit of Yahweh Bashem Yahushua manifesting his saints. Or you have the spirit of error. Right? Let's look up this word error. And there's really no in-between. It ain't okay. I kind of got the spirit of truth and I kind of got the spirit of error. Right? It's either you got one or the other. Either you hot or you cold. Here's the word air. Strong's G, 4106, plane, plane. So here's the spirit of air. Air which shows itself in action, a wrong mode of acting, wandering strand about, one led astray from the right way, roams hither and thither. Mental strain, right? Air, wrong opinion relative to morals or religion. So that's someone who's not stable. If you don't have the spirit of truth, you'll be caught up in the world and going to and fro like the spiritual demon Satan. Man. That's what Satan's job is, to roam the earth and go to and fro. All right, so let's go back to this. Well, let's actually go to this. This is Deuteronomy chapter 22. Now, I really want to, the main focus I want to start on is in 20, but I want to try to touch on this whole chapter. So now this starts off with sun-dry laws. We covered the word sun-dry before. The word sun-dry means diverse. 
All right, Deuteronomy chapter 22 and 1. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray and hide himself, hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again unto thy brother. Right? That's plain. And a lot of these laws, you may say, I don't have to keep that. I don't have an ox. I don't have a sheep. That doesn't apply to me. I'm moving on. Right? Where's the wine and the drink at? You know, you have to look at these laws and commandments and understand that this can still and it should still be applied to this very day. Right? A brother might have a dog. He might get let loose. Right? You might see something happening to your brother's property. Right? You got to stand up and say something, man. Right? You can't hide yourself from your brother's uh, possessions. You're commanded to go help your brother. In the ancient world, an ox may have been going astray, may have broke loose, a sheep broke loose. You got to stop what the hell you doing and go bring that brother's sheep back to him, man. All right. And if thy brother be not nigh unto thee, or if thou know not, if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring it into thine own house, and it shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it, and thou shalt restore it to him again. So there's no finders keepers. Oh wow, wow. Look, I found, you know, I found a new uh iPhone just laying out. Right, right on the sidewalk in front of my neighbor's house. Well, finders keepers. No, that's of the world. That's not up to most high, right? So if you find something and it doesn't belong to you and it's in your area community, chiefly when we're amongst our own people, hey, guess what? You got to hold on to that thing. Bro. You know, you put it in a box, put it somewhere in, on a shelf, in an attic. Hey, look, this is so-and-so's. Now, when they come looking for it, you got to give it to them, right? So that, that's the law right there. Verse uh, three. And like manner shalt thou do with his ass, and so shalt thou do with his raiment, right? And with all lost thing of thy brothers which he hath lost, and thou hast found, shalt thou do likewise, thou mayest not hide thyself. Yeah, you can't find a, a brother drop a hundred dollars and you help him put your foot on it. That's what Jake do in the world. Somebody drop their wallet, somebody put their foot on it, and then they, they try to distract you, then you help him pick up that money, man. You know, people do social experiments like that. They'll walk up to people and say, hey, look, you dropped your hundred dollars. Or matter of fact, a guy, he'll have a briefcase. He'll act like he's blind and he'll drop a whole bunch of money on the floor. Right? And the people, they start taking that money. People start pocketing that money. Rarely do you see people say, hey, look, you dropped your money. And people hide they so. So ain't no finders, keepers. Look, he uh, his loss. One man's trash is another man's treasure spirit. man. Right? All right. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or ass far down by the way and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. Right. So if a brother ox fell, you got to help him. Like if a brother got a flat tire, you got to think about this in modern day terms. If a brother got a flat and he's hitting you up, you, you can't just ignore that brother. Man. I ain't none of my business. Or you're driving by the side of the road and you see a brother. You know, he in the truth and he's looking like this and you know him and he's scratching his head and his steam going from the um the um under the hood of the car. And he he looks perplexed, man. And you just drive by and say, that's because that brother wasn't studying. And you step on the gas, man. And you kind of do it. You act like you're going to hit him, but you swerve away a little bit. Right? To kind of put more fear in his heart. And then a water splash on him and splash on his car, man. And make the car a little bit worse than what it was. Then the brother called you and he tell you, hey, look, I had a flat. You're like, damn, really? What happened? How'd that happen? Well, you saw him, man. Huh? You can't hide yourself when your brother needs something or when he's in need. Right? You see a brother carrying a big bunch of uh, posters to camp and he's struggling, he's sweating, and he's just sitting there watching. Right? So like, this brother ain't strong. Well, brother, he's supposed to help that brother out, man. You got brothers that move. Hey, look, I'm trying to move, man. Look, look, I need help, you know, moving out the house. And you got to help that guy, man. You know, let that brother know your situation. Hey, look, I come on my way. He's, he's moving out a four-bedroom house by himself. He's begging you to help him because his back hurts. 
and you just hide yourself and put the phone on do not disturb. Kick your feet up and start watching the big game, man. So he got it. Endure, you text him, endure hardness as a good soldier. Present your body a living sacrifice. Right? So these laws teach you how to deal with one another. Verse 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Yeah, that's plain. No cross-dressing. No woman uh, putting on pants. No men. What's his man? Kid, uh, you had LeBron. Did LeBron James wear a dress? Let's see if we can get this guy. That Medea spirit. Look at this. Now you can say, well, hold on. He got a jersey on. He's not. Well, he got a wig on. Because a brother might say, well, that's only talking about garments. I could wear a wig. No, it's, it's not. It's not what that's saying. Right? You can't dress like a woman. Look at this. All right. Hold on. Look at this. And this is the worst. They said, look, Kid Cuddy, you can come on SNL now. We picked your, your, your garment out. Put this dress on. Well, I don't know if I should wear that dress. Do you want to be on SNL? We can get you back to where you used to be. You used to be a top rapper. But, hey, look, you got to put this dress on. Well, look, I don't know. You know, give me a chance to think. But, well, look, you got five seconds. One, two, three. Okay, okay, okay. I'll put the dress on. And, and they do this. That old Amalekite, he put his glasses on. All right. And he do this. And they bring the dress out, man. Some young, you know, uh, Edomite woman bring the dress out. Hold it up to you like this. You put your head down, right? And you sign that contract to perform on SNL for about maybe $45,000 or so, right? Look at this. You know? This is madness. Right? Absolute madness. Oh, wow. Look at this. All right. So the brother Azariah sent me this, too. All right? This stuff has to stop, man. Look at this madness. Le Dress. They call him Le Goat, LeBron. Le Dress, man. Muscle T. I know it's kind of blurry. Right? But you, you can see what it is. Dressed like a schoolgirl. And he got a purse. And somebody ironed that dress. It's not even like, okay, we'll just put this on. Hey, he hey, he ironed that thing, man. Huh? Then he picked the shirt to match. I haven't seen this one yet. Right? Dressed like a 14-year-old a schoolgirl. He's dressed like an adolescent, man. Huh? A prepubescent. So let's go back to this. Right? Where is this at? See that? So you can't have this spirit, man. This is against the most high. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 33. So right now we're dealing with diverse uh, laws. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 33. For the Most High is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. This is nothing but confusion and madness, right? Now there's another one, man. Some of these are worse than others. Now you had that guy... Um, Damn, what's that man's name from uh, Get Out? He was in Get Out. Now, they showed him on the cover of the magazine. He had uh, fishnet stockings on, bro. And he had all types of mascara on. What's this guy's name, man? Um, Salakia. Right? He was the guy who played in Get Out. Yeah, Lakeith Stanfield. Let's see. So this is madness. It's just outright evil. Well, I can't find it now, but hey, one of these magazine covers, this man had a um he had fishnet, fishnet stockings on. So I'm not gonna spend all day looking for it, but hey, these men are effeminate now. Right, the, the average man is effeminate. 
See, back then the Lord said we wore ancient warlike garments. And then you can't have a woman trying to, you know, look like a man. See, the Lord isn't dealing with this, man. Right? That's This is confusion. Heels on, pants on, I mean, uh, pecs swole, biceps cut lean, fit, you know? Nothing wrong with being in shape and taking care of yourself, but you got pants on. This is confusion. Right? Look at this. So this world is backwards. Look at this. This is sick. And earth, this earth is defiled. Right? This earth is defiled. All right, we can go all day, which I'm not going to spend all day. Okay. All right, so this is uh, what a man's garment. But they say, well, look, that's a woman's suit. There's no such thing. Or those are women's pants. There has to be some separation between what a man has and what a woman has on in terms of garments, right? Men were ancient men. They had their own apparel. Women had their own apparel. Women had dresses, head wraps, right? Jewels and sandals and things of that nature. Read Isaiah the third chapter. And men had staffs, metries, turbans, garments, coats, right? These are the things that men had on. Right, so we got to check that spirit because now you got men. You had this one brother who's being forced in school to wear a dress now, and I believe his his father came up there and actually got him a teacher, and the teacher act like you know they didn't really know what the problem was. So in these schools now, they're encouraging men to dress like girls and, and girls to dress like boys. All right, verse six: If a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way. And any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs, and the dam sitting upon a young or upon the eggs, thou shalt not take the dam with the young. Yeah, you have to uh, um, have some type of preservation spirit, right? So if you want eggs, don't take the, the chicken and the eggs, right? Why would you kill the mother and take the eggs? You don't take the dam and the young. You don't take the little chicks and the mother. All right, you have to have some type of common sense and wisdom and say, well, look, if I take the mother, well, where am I going to get the rest of the eggs from? If I take the mother and the young, then I deplete my food source. Let me take one of the young. Let me take one of the eggs, and I'll let that the mother could keep making more. So this teaches you how to deal with the beast of the field. The so-called white man doesn't follow these kind of laws. He hunts animals to their extinct. He doesn't care about the young and the old. He'll kill a, a, a zebra, a lion, a rhinoceros. He'll cut the horn off of, of a rhino and sell it. The tusk off an elephant. And sometimes he, he just do, do this stuff for fun, man. That's why there's this video I always like to watch of this Edomite going in his lion cage. And the lion come up and get uh, uh, get up with him and kind of drag me. You hear, you hear his family in the background kind of screaming and saying, hey, look, hey, look, somebody get this lion from off of my, my dad. Man. So I like to go back and kind of watch these Edomites getting attacked because that's judgment. That's judgment from Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shah because they don't know how to deal with the trees. They don't know how to deal with the water. Remember, the Lord said they're the ones that destroy the earth. We have laws on how to deal with nature. How to deal with animals and beasts. First, let's go to uh, Proverbs 12. This is how you know the world was made for us because there are uh, set commandments on how to deal with the animals that you eat. Not just what can be eaten, what not, what can't be eaten, but how to even eat what's lawful, right? How to apply wisdom to eat what's lawful and how to discern these things. Proverbs chapter 12 and 10. A righteous man regarded the life of his beast. But the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. You see that? So Esau has tender mercies. His tender mercies are really cruel. Right? He will lock animals all up in the zoo and say, we're being merciful. We don't want them to fight. 
right? We'll take the leopard. We'll take the lion from its natural habitat. We'll put it in, in the Bronx. They got lions in the Bronx, in the zoo. The zebras from, from the, uh, the land of Ham, who are roam free, took them and put them up in, in D.C. somewhere. That's cruel, man. Hunting lions for fun. Let me see this. Uh... And it's and Jake don't do that. Jake, if Jake does go hunting, Jake they only they'll catch a um. Let's see this. They'll they'll hunt a deer or, or something like that, right? But Esau, look at this. See that? You can't. They're not going to eat the lion. They're not going to sell the lion. They're going to get up and go back home. To somewhere in Boston, and and take they might take a picture, they might uh, get his fur, or they might chop his head off and put it somewhere in the attic, and then say, ah, we don't like this anymore. They'll just take his head and put it up in a box somewhere and stuff it in the garage, and see it is what it is. See that? So that's why the earth has to be turned back over to the hands of the righteous. The earth has to be turned back over. And Esau get off on stuff like this, man. This is his MO. That's what these animals be tearing Esau up. So when you're dealing with the beast and food, the Lord is telling you what? If you see a bird's nest on the ground or in the tree, Right, or you see the young ones in the eggs, and you got the mother sitting upon the young ones. Don't take the mother with the babies, man. Right, just take one of the young ones and you eat, and then they can make another one, man. All right, that's plain, so understand that too. But thou shall, and it's hey, look, you might see a nest in Jacob's trouble, you might get greedy, you might be a pilgrim on the earth, and you know, your eyes get too big and you forget the law. You see the mother hen. Right, and you see the little babies, and you're like, man, that mother hen and the baby, that's that's good. No, you can't. You can't take them both. You got to remember that law. So well, hold on, what the law says, I got to let her go free, right? And I and I got to take this one. You know, that's why it reads, but thou shalt in any wise let the dam go. The dam is the mother, and take the young to thee, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days. When thou, so these are diverse laws. When thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, that thou bring not blood upon thine house, if any man fall from thence. So a battlement is pretty much like a, a barrier. So nobody falls off, right? That That's plain. That's plain. You have to have some type of barrier so nobody falls off. You'll see houses now, they don't have that on the roof, right? Show me the last time you seen somebody's roof. With a battlement on it. So Esau is breaking all types of commandments. Right? But you got to pay all of these taxes and do all. He's not even keeping the laws in his house. Every house he builds should have a battlement on it. Right? But he wants you to pay the HSA fees. He wants you to pay all types of taxes. You got to pay all types of madness going on. But he's not even keeping these simple commandments. All right? You got people falling off of roofs and Roofs caving in it because they don't have the battlement right there. You gotta have the battlement. Let me pull that word up. And Deuteronomy 22. Because guess what? If somebody died on your house, who's gonna get who's gonna get jammed up? You're gonna get jammed up. See that? A low wall at the edge of a balcony, roof or along the sides of a bridge. Right? So if a guy fall off your roof, you're going to get charged with that that uh, uh that murder, man. Huh? The judges are going to say, well, what happened to this guy? Or oh, well, he fell off the roof. And the first question they're going to ask is say, well, hey, well, look, did this guy have a battlement? Now, if you say yes, then you can escape. And they're going to make they may ask a few more questions. But if you say no, hey, hey you're going you're going to get jammed up, man. Huh? Right? You're going to get jammed up. Let's read on. Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with diverse seeds, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Yeah, you can't plant, dig a, a, a pit in the ground and put an apple seed and an orange seed in there. 
right? You can't crossbreed and have hybrid fruits. Esau has a whole diverse list of hybrid fruits, plums and apricots, oranges and grapes, uh, tangerines and mixed with this and pears mixed with apples. So he's not keeping that commandment, right? And this, this commandment is on different levels too. So on one level, let's see if we can get this. Um, it's lucky I kind of spelled it wrong, hybrid fruits. Okay, so here's, here's a list of hybrid fruits and vegetables. They say worth trying. Right. Well, we're not supposed to be dabbling into that stuff, man. Right. You're not supposed to be dabbling into, into doing these things. All right. So let's see what they got here. A plary, a pluary, which is a plum and a cherry. A, a peacherine, a peach and a nectarine. Plum cut, plum and an apricot. A pluot, which is a, a more plum and less apricot. A picotum, a peach, apricot, and a plum. A blood lime, a lime, mandarin, a lime quad. Brussel kale, raspberry, called a tayberry. A tangelo, brocca flower, brock kelly. So this. This is madness, man. They mixing all types of stuff. And Jake go to the store. Oh, oh wow. Look at Let the apple be the apple. Let the orange be the orange. Right? Like somebody said, that's why the uh, fruits don't have any taste, man. And half of these fruits don't have any seeds in it. It's a rare thing to get a fruit with seeds in it. Because, you know, sometimes they're not even... Sowing it with diversity, some of this fruit they're just making in the laboratory. They even just approved the fact that they could do lab lab grown chicken. Right? And, they, and they're gonna dip that to you, Jakes, man. And some weird Edomites that want to try it. They're gonna ask the Edomites, do you want to try this in your Whole Foods and your stores? And they're gonna have a petition in the town hall meeting and they're gonna talk about it. But you Jakes, you're just gonna get this lamb gro uh lab grown chicken in your store, man. And they, they're making meats with 3D printers. So this is a strange, strange land that you dwell in. See that? 3D printer meat. So people are eating 3D, 3D printer steaks. So this guy, he's the chef now. So they don't use, look at this madness. This is sick. Oh, that's so sick. And vile. So no longer do you have to use a skillet and use the onion salt. I mean, the onion uh, a powder, the garlic salt, right? The season all. Now you just type it in the computer what you want. And the computer, however they do it, they form this kind of meat. They make like a 3D meat and they paint it, right? They kind of heat it up from the bottom, bat from the battery. And then you got your steak. All right, that's your steak. So you got, got to be careful in this society, man. Right? You, you buy fruit, the fruit doesn't even get old anymore. There were times when you would buy a fruit and a fruit would be, um, it'll turn brown. You bite into an apple, it'll get brown in about maybe, you know, 10 minutes or so. You leave it out. Now nah, that's not even happening. All right? Now you bite into an apple and, and even flies don't even come around. Your dog kind of smell that meat like he he turned his nose too. So well, what the hell is this? I'll eat any I'll eat anything, but this even the beasts of the field they're turning away in the fowls of the air from this food, man. This food doesn't even break down now. It doesn't decay. It does see food is it's created from beasts and plants, and it's supposed to go back to the earth again. When you're making stuff in laboratories, and it's not going to decompose and go back into the earth because it wasn't made from the earth. So you have people with diverse seeds and all types of fake fruits.
genetically modified. Look at this. This is what you buy in your grocery store. You say, oh, wow, look at that plum. That's a nice plum. Well, 30 days before you bought that plum, some bugged out Edomite took a syringe with God knows what in it and stuck it in there, man. It's, and stuck that juice in there. Now you bought that plum. Oh, man, my stomach, I don't know what it was. Well, brother, that's because you got that, that juice in you now. They fly these guys from these laboratories to these farms and they start injecting this stuff in this thing, man. Right? That's why the fruit always looks so shiny. It looks good. They spray it. They paint it. That's why we, hey, the Lord said we'll eat our defiled bread. Right? Amongst the Gentiles. I got to get, I want to get back to Deuteronomy, right? But uh, let me get this one more real quick. Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 13. And the Lord said, even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whether I will drive them. So that's a prophecy that we will eat defiled food amongst these heathen, right? It's a prophecy. So, you know, you... It's hard, man. It's hard to, you know, you want to eat right. You want to take care of yourself. And then you, you know, there's a lot of things that deter you from that. Hosea 9 and 3. They should not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. So the Most High said we're going to eat these unclean things in captivity. All right. Rather, you're in Assyria, Egypt, and Egypt and Assyria are also synonymous for Babylon the Great and different places of our captivity. All right. So you can't sow your seed, I mean, your vineyard with diverse seeds. And then a lot of these laws are very spiritual. So we're also sowing seeds. The seed that we're sowing is the word of the Most High. There's an entire parable in Matthew, the 13th chapter, uh, Luke, Matthew, right? In, in the book of uh, Mark, the fourth chapter about the sower that soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. So the seed that we're sowing is this truth. And the vineyard is our people, right? Let's get that in Isaiah 5. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 7. <coughs> For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah, his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, <coughs> but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. So we're in the vineyard. So we have to look at this law and apply it to the ministry. If we are in the vineyard, we can't sow diverse seeds amongst our people. There's only one seed <coughs> that we should be sowing. Now let's get that. Salaki. This is the book of Mark, chapter 4, and verse 14. The sower soweth the word. So the word is the seed that we're planting. And the vineyard is our people. Right? And we can't take this word and sow it amongst Islam. Give you a little bit of Christianity. Plant the seed of truth and dabble it into New Age philosophy. And then what kind of fruit are you going to bear? You're going to bear a fruit of confusion and hybrid fruit. That Chrislam fruit that I know I'm an Israelite, but I also, you know, I study uh, uh, Islam. Right. I'm a five percenter and I'm an Asiatic black man, but I'm also from the 12 tribes of Judah. You got people saying I'm from the 12 tribes of Judah. Well, that's because you got these different seeds in you. All right. And if you're sowing those diverse seeds. The Most High is going to get up with you. Right? That's why it reads, lest the fruit of thy seed, which thou hast sown, and the fruit of the vineyard be defiled. Because at the end of the day, <clears throat> the Lord is looking to gather fruit. And if the Lord gather fruit from you, and that fruit is defiled, the number one finger he's going to point at is you. He said, what kind of fruit is this? Right? I let you out of my vineyard to plant seeds and this is the fruit you're giving me. I'm hungry and I want to eat. And, and this is what you're giving me to eat. You're going to look at that fruit and he's going to banish you from the vineyard. 
So if you're bringing up fruit that's defiled, don't be surprised if you, you know, you're not in this thing for too long, right? Let's go to Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Let's prove that. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, and verse 11. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman. He let out the vineyard unto keepers. Every one for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. My vineyard, which is mine, is before me. Thou, O Solomon, must have a thousand, and those that keep the fruit thereof, two hundred. So what does this mean? This is a dark saying. When it says Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Haman, <clears throat> on a spiritual level, it's speaking about Yahweh Shai having a vineyard, which is the nation. He let out this vineyard unto keepers. The keepers are the prophets, the apostles, the evangelists, to watch over this vineyard and make sure that things are running smoothly, seeds are being planted, that there be no breaking in and thieves, right? That the wine press remains intact, that the tower remains built and stable, and that the Lord gets his fruit, right? Pretty much is like a, a, a sharecropping. You know, you work on someone else's land, you get some of it, but you got to give them a great portion of it. So everyone for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver, right? Meaning when you're in this vineyard, <coughs> there are two things. <clears throat> you got to pay in this vineyard, right? To be in this vineyard and you got to pay up to uh, um to the owner of the vineyard, right? Think about it like a barbershop or a, a salon when you want to rent a booth out or rent a chair out. You got to pay for that chair or pay for that booth. Right. And then once you start getting your customers and your clients, let's say, you, you know, you're making a hundred dollars, right? A cut or whatever. Right. Out of that hundred dollars, you got to take a percentage of that and give it to, to the barber or whoever owned the shop. Right. It reads my vineyard, which is mine, is before me. Thou, O Solomon, must have a thousand and those that keep the fruit thereof two hundred. So we get two hundred and Solomon get a thousand. Right, because really at the end of the day, our honor and glory goes to how about Shmi Abishai? They get a thousand perfection. We don't get a thousand, we get two hundred. Right? We're not on the same level as Yahweh Shah. The point of the matter is we have to deal with fruit and bring that fruit to the Lord. So if you're sowing diverse seeds, your fruit is going to be defiled and you're going to be exiled out of that vineyard. Right? Let's read on. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and 10. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. Yeah, that's confusion. If you're plowing with an ox and an ass, the, the ox <clears throat> is going to mess up your field because the ox is going to move a little bit um, stronger than the ass. And the ass isn't going to be able to keep up. So your field is going to look uneven. It's going to be unbalanced. That's called being unequally yoked. That's why it tells you in the law. People say, I don't like the apostle Paul. Well, why would the Apostle Paul, first uh, second Corinthians, Slakia, chapter six and fourteen? Why would the Apostle Paul actually quote the law? It reads, "Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers." Where is this coming from? This comes back to the Book of Deuteronomy. When something is unequally yoked, it means that one force is going to pull the other force. So the ox is going to pull the ass. So if you're unequally yoked together with unbelievers, that unbeliever is going to pull. See, their ways of evil is going to be stronger than your ways of truth. So the Lord is warning you, saying, "Look, don't be spending too much time with them, because they don't they don't care. They don't have they don't give a damn. They're more in tune with evil than you are with truth, and they're naturally going to pull you." away from the truth. When you're yoked, you're connected. You're joined hip by hip. Right? And that's why we have to understand uh, um, ancient uh, Hebrew, Israelite culture and lifestyles to understand what these scriptures actually mean. So when you're unequally yoked, it means that they're going to pull you away from the Most High. Their will to be evil outweighs your will to be righteous. And the Lord knows that. 
right? So that's why you're commanded not to plow with an ox and the ass together. That breeds confusion. That's like doing the work <clears throat> and, and you got all types of spirits going on, right? You want to make sure that you have everything done and weighed in the balance. Right now we're plowing and teaching. Right now we're doing the work. Men go out on the highways and byways and they plant seeds, but everything's done in order with, with common spirits, right? We don't have men in the world and men in the truth plowing the field, man. We don't have Islam out there with Christianity. That would be plowing with an ox and the ass. You got a Christian pastor out there and a Catholic priest and an Israelite. All doing the work, all plowing. That's going to cause nothing but confusion. An ox and the ox should be plowing together. Or an ass and the ass should be plowing together. That's that chris Lam spirit. They, this world wants to plow with an ox and the ass, man. Let me put that chris Lam up. Chris, Chris Lam. See, this is plowing with an ox in the ass. They're actually building mosque and um, synagogue side by side, man. Trying to combine all of these religions and then plow the field, which is the people of the earth. And teach them the truth. Right? And try to teach them their truth, should I say. So no plowing with an ox in the ass. And that's really any move that you make in life. Right? Any step that you take forward, any opportunity, any investment, it can't be plowed with an ox in the ass. Things have to be weighed in the balance. And things have to be done decently and in order. Otherwise, it's going to breed confusion. Right, the Lord even said, All all beast consorted to his like, and a man will cleave unto his neighbor. Right in the book of Ecclesiastes, the 13th chapter. So before you make an endeavor or perform a task, you have to ask yourself, are you plowing with an ox in the ass? Is everybody on one accord? Is does everybody have the, the mind of an ass and the mind of an ox are two different minds? The ass is not thinking about what the what the ox is thinking about. They walk different. They need different times of rest. The ox may need rest an hour into the work, and the ass may need uh, rest two hours into the work. Now the ox is asleep, and the ass is pulling the ox. Then the ass is falling, you know, weary. Then the ox get up. It's nothing but madness. So this law teaches you a lot right here, man. A lot of men are plowing with oxes and asses and don't even know it. Right? You're spending too much time at your job. That's you plowing with an ox in the ass. You're unequally yoked. You spend all day and night at your job and you give a little bit to the most high. That's why your fruit is not what it should be, man. And your land is defiled. And you're bringing up thorns and briars thereof. So let's read on. So this is why we have to go into these laws and actually kind of break them down. What it means with the seeds and the plowing and what the garments go into, right? I'm about to read that. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. Now, this means that, and this is a hard commandment to keep in Babylon and Great because you have so many different new garments, new, new uh, fabrics, so-called. You have polyester, right? You have uh, all types of stuff, man, that they're making in laboratories. You know, you got... Velcro, and they don't just have woolen and linen. You got satin, right? You got you got silk, you got woolen, you got linen, you got cotton, you got all you got denim, you got all types of these different types of uh, uh, styles going on. Cotton stuff. Now in the ancient world, we really only wore woolen and linen. So we're gonna break this down on a, a physical level first, right? So you have to have woolen or linen. You can't start a garment. So you have people that work at the, um, let's put this up in Proverbs chapter 31, right? I believe this is what I want. Proverbs chapter uh, 31 and 13. She seeketh wool 
and flax and work it willingly with their hands. But there's another one I want. She layeth her hands to the spindle. This is the Proverbs 31 woman. And her hands hold the distaff. So this is what an ancient righteous woman would do. Some of the work, she would put her hand to the spindle. Let's pull up the spindle. A spindle whore or a distaff. Let's, let's actually find this because this is not common language for our people. Let's pull up an ancient spindle. So here's a spindle. Let's see. Uh, Okay, spindles. Basically, they would take yarn. I'm not going to pull up a whole breakdown and take thread and use it to make garments. All right? They would take spindles and distaffs and use it to make garments. All right, let me see if I can. See that? All right? People crochet now. People knit. Right? They deal with yarn. They make, make all types of stuff. All right? So ancient women would use this. So they would have silk. Right? Or they would have, you know, wool. But they couldn't have one with silk. I mean, one with uh, wool and one with linen. And kind of start just making a garment with both of them. Right? You see what, they, what we would use. Right, different ancient sewing and garment making material. And you can't start with one kind of fabric and then take that fabric off, mix with another fabric, and now you have a garment that's half cotton and, and it's cross stitched and intertwined with linen. All right, that, that breeds confusion. And you have to look up these ancient um words and these ancient terms. So let's look up a distaff. See that? A distaff is a tool used in spinning. All right? Ask the average so-called Black, Hispanic, or Native American woman, have you used a distaff? They're going to say no, but I took a shot of uh, uh, E&J last night, though. I know what that E&J is. Right? Our ancient woman knew what a distaff was. And you can watch these, watch a video, man. So you see that? So they would take this and they would actually kind of get down. So she's starting with cotton right there. And she's working her line and working her thread. And spinning it so it can kind of be in the line so she could use it for whatever purpose she want to use it for. Well, I don't know what that is, but that's what they would do. All right, they would use distaffs for spinning. It is designed to hold unspun fibers, keeping them untangled and thus easing the spinning process. It is most commonly used to hold flax and sometimes wool. That's what we read in Proverbs chapter 31, that the righteous Proverbs woman, 31 woman, did what? Right? She, let's go back up, Proverbs 31 and 13. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. So she had to keep this commandment. If she was making this garment, she couldn't say, well, look, all of the linen is cheap. I'll just do a little bit of linen and the wool was a little bit cheap and I'll kind of get a good deal and I'll make a garment. And the Lord is going to get up with her, man. When I say get up, judge, punish, destroy. Because you're breeding confusion in the earth. So these are ancient tools that were used by our foremothers. And this is something Eve, you know, Eve should really get into, man. Eve should know how to sew. Eve should know how to uh, sew by hand, use a sewing machine, crochet, knit, distaff, spindles, cook. Read Proverbs 31, man. She knew how to buy a field. She, these are a lot of things that, that we knew. 
Right now, Eve just wants a degree from an HBCU and join the, uh, that green and pink sorority, man. And, and feel like they accomplished something to be an independent black woman. So the point is, you can't wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. All right, now, really in the ancient world, linen was used, linen has a lot of different properties that wool doesn't have, right? When you look up linen, let's pull up, um, just type this in. Okay, there's something. Let's see. Um, let's see the healing. I believe this is what I saw. Let me pull this up. Okay, so here's linen, right? It, it reads the healing power of linen. Remember that uh, uh, the Lord said that the elect are compared to having fine linen on in Revelation the 19th chapter. So there's something about linen and woolen. That, that have a particular um, uh, information behind it that the Lord knows, man. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8. And to her, meaning the elect, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Why, why does the elect in their best glory compare us to fine linen? Why not denim jackets and cotton? Wool. It's not as if these things, you know, um, are new or flax. Fine linen is the top fabric in the ancient world. And fine linen is the supreme garment material. Because the most I knew something about that linen. See, wool, if I'm not mistaken, linen, is it made from beast? Cotton is. What's like not cotton? Wool is. Cotton is made from plants. Right, uh, uh, flax as well, but linen is made in a particular fashion. So you deal with linen. It reads, um, and then not, it's like and then not so distant past, less than one hundred years ago, and right on the back to the fall of man, people robed themselves in linen, wool, and animal hides from their outwear to their underwear, including socks. They slept on linen. They used linen towels, napkins, and tablecloths for personal and ceremonial purposes. Wore linen hats, coats, gloves, and sashes. Linen is hypoallergenic, antibacterial, and antifungal. So if you, you can naturally take away from the strength and the potency of that linen if you mix it with, with, um, with wool. Right, you're diluting the power of, of that garment if you're mixing it with other garments. That's like you take this this truth and you mix it with an old garment. Right? I mean, it's not just this site. There are multiple sites, or, or you know, even Esau saying, "Hey, look, linen has a particular spirit about it." They don't use the word spirit. You know, they go into they their words, but you can't take an old garment and mix a new garment. Right, you can't do these things, so that's why that parable that Yahweh said in the book of Matthew, the ninth chapter, is so important. All right, this is Matthew chapter 9. All right, it's like in verse 16 No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up, take it from the garment. And the rent is made worse. Because if you take the old philosophies and the old ways of the world and you mix it with this truth, you take away from the power of this truth. You take away from the potency of this truth. Because you're mixing Yahushua and Yahweh and God loves everybody. You're trying to tie it in with the Bible. You can't take the old you and mix it with the new you. All right, it don't work like that. You can't sew a garment with diverse uh, a linen on, huh? And diverse wool. Let's go to Song of Solomon, chapter five. 
Song of Solomon, chapter 5 and 3. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? So you put off your coat. You put off that old garment. Then you put on a new garment. Why? The Lord said, how shall I put it on? I mean, how would you take off your old garment, wash yourself in the living water, and then put that old garment back on on top of your new garment? What sense does it make to wash your feet and go to follow them again? Right? And you wash your feet when you come into this truth spiritually. So the scriptures are plain. Straight up and down, you can't wear a garment with linen and woolen together. All right, let's go back to this. I'm going to finish this article. So linen is hypoallergenic, antibacterial, and antifungal. Right? And it was always, when you look it up, it was used in hospitals. A lot of hospitals, they, they say, look, we're only going to use linen. All right? Until recently, it has always been used, you see that, for uh, sutures and bandages. It breathes. It keeps the body cooler in hot temperatures and warmer and cold. And we lived in that kind of climate, bro. So we had to have naturally these uh, types of fabrics and garments that, you know, took care of us, man. You think Abraham would have wore a hot denim jacket? You know, some hot cotton? No, man, that stuff, you'd be sweating and, you know, all types of stuff. That's why there's a law that says that the priest... Let me get that in Ezekiel. I believe that's 44. That they can't even wear anything that makes them to sweat. Right? This is um, Ezekiel 44 and 18. This is in the kingdom, right? They shall have linen bonnets upon their head and shall have linen breeches upon their loins. They shall not gird themselves with anything that causeth sweat. Right? So in the ancient world, they had to have set material. You couldn't just put on what you want to put on. Some thick wool. Now you know the priests in there, they sweat now. Their hands slippery and they drop the showbread. They sweat and they, they mind. They can't focus. It's hot as hell. Then they're, they're dealing with the fire, the sacrifice. And, and you know, they get the sweat off their brow. They drop the sweat on the bullock. And then they offer the bullock up with sweat on it. It's all types of confusion that can come with that. Right. So the Lord said, look, I got the material made strictly for priests. That priest is going to be linen. I mean, that, that priest will wear nothing but linen. Otherwise, anything is going to cause him to sweat and it's going to he could drop the manure. Right. He, you know, he could slip and fall. His hands, you know how your hands get all clammy. You're not in the right spirit when you're sweating. Huh? You start getting distracted and your mind start getting bad. Right. So that's why you have this, man. It says um, it keeps the body cooler and hot temperatures and the priests are dealing with fire, dealing with the flames of sacrifices and the altar. You know, they're doing a lot of heavy lifting. They're lifting animals up they're removing uh, organs. Right. And warmer in the cold. Linen can absorb absorb moisture up to 20 percent without feeling death. And that links directly up with the law. Right. And the Mosai knows this. All this science that Esau is figuring out, the Mosai been knew that. He's the one that created it. That's why he said, hey, look, don't sew that linen and woolen. Do it if you want to. It's going to put a spirit on you. Now, a lot of people got spirits on them. Huh? People getting sick and all types of madness. And a lot of these clothes and fabric got chemicals in it and dyes and it kind of get into your skin and you're itching and you, you touch something that shock you. You're supposed to be dealing with all of that shock. That show you something ain't right, man. Shouldn't be able, uh, able to wear clothes and you touch something and you harm yourself. The metals and the elements of the earth. You're supposed to be in tune with the elements of the earth. Shouldn't be able to touch metals and shock and harm yourself. Right? The Lord has given you fabrics and clothes to be in tune with the heat of the sun, with the metals and the elements and the irons and the steels, man, that you may live a life of, of security. Laws on how to deal with your beast and how to deal with the land and all of this is for us. All right. So let me finish this and I'm going to move on. Linen can absorb, absorb moisture up to 20% without feeling that. It resists dirt and...
it does not produce static electricity. And I haven't read this article, man. Right? This is my first time reading this. So you can't be wearing stuff when you damn electrocuting yourself, man. You got this woolen hat, you're rubbing your, your socks on the floor, you're grabbing a balloon, you're rubbing it, you're touching stuff, and you're zapping people. The, the Lord's not dealing with that demonic attitude, man. You just want to zap everybody. You're figuring stuff out and you're rubbing this and, you know, it does not produce static electricity. In fact, it kills it. So you take care of your health, man. You don't have to deal with that stuff. Linen is radiation resistant. Linen reduces the effects of chemical exposure, can cut down noise, right? Because they test that. They test frequency as it goes through... Um, you know, different materials. That's how they make soundproof uh, um, material. Like if you want a soundproof room, you can actually put these things on your wall. And I, and I kind of want to get some, right? Kind of get some soundproof things on the wall. And they test it uh, and they run through experiments to see how the sound waves kind of go through. Right? And they, and they test the limits. They say, well, look, the sound is kind of bouncing off. They test that thing. So it's like a, a super material. That's why the priests wear it. That's why in Revelation 19, they have it. The elect have it. I believe even in the same chapter, hold on, let me go back. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 19. Right, Revelation 19 and verse, yep, here we have it, verse 14. And the armies, these are the angels, which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses clothed in what? Fine linen, white and clean. That's the top material on the earth. I don't care what Jake is talking about. I don't care about their Versace belt, Gucci belt they want to show off. Jake, you had them leather jackets in the 90s. And nobody wants to wear no hot leather as the priest, man. Some of the whole leather garment. See if you got a, a leather girdle, because that's thick. You need that, you know, so nobody kind of thrusts you through, and it's kind of that thick material. Right? So nobody's even keeping the laws of fabrics and garments, man. People got thick linen jackets and cotton. It. Well, look, leather's only made for a set reason. Leather's made for a particular purpose. You shouldn't just make leather anything. You got these fashion designers who just do what they want to do, man. See, this world is defiled. Everything's defiled, not just the food. Even the fabrics and the garments are defiled. The angels wear fine linen. All right? Let's finish this, and we'll move on. Okay, it reads, um, in fact, it kills it. Linen is radiation resistant. Linen reduces the effects of chemical exposure and can cut down noise. Right, linen curtains and drapes and dust. Linen produced from flax is the strongest of all vegetable fibers, two to three times stronger than cotton. And why can't you uh, buy linen as much as you buy cotton? Because cotton is cheap. Anybody, I mean, cotton, you just get it, it is what it is. It's rare that you find garments made of linen nowadays. I'm, tell me I'm lying. When the last time you put on the back of a tag and said 100% linen? Esau, these elites got that. When they gave you Negroes denim and cotton and leather and, and polyester, they gave you just, same, like they gave you pork. They just give you the, the scraps. Here's some cotton and some, a denim jacket and a, a polyester. Here, here, it is what it is. And they have heaped up. All of the silk and all of the fine linen with all of its power on it and gave it to their elites to rule the earth and eat. That they may prolong their days and that you can get sick and get shocked and have all types of chemical exposure and die the death of the wicked. Man. All right. So let's let's go back to this. We can do a whole lesson on this right here. So there, the Lord doesn't give that in-depth explanation. Because you don't have to. Just follow what he said and you'll be all right, man. Why do I have to wear that? 
right? How come I can't do willing and lending? Well, brother, you don't understand why the Most High said this. And there is more to it than we even know. When you dive deep into that, they say there are actual um, so-called kind of frequencies that come with those uh, materials, man. You know? But let's read on. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts as of woolen and linen together. Thou shalt make the fringes upon the four quarters of thy vesture wherewith thou coverest thyself. So four quarters means all the way around, right? It doesn't mean I got a little bit here. I got a string hanging here. I got a string hanging here and I got a string hanging there. Four quarters is not literal. Just like when the Lord said that we're scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. We're not literally in four different corners. We're scattered all around. But Amalek looked at that verse and they put a little string hanging here, got a little white string hanging here, one in the back and one in there, and they, and they link, lift up their string and they spin it, right, until they die. Well, no, man, the, the four quarters means completely around. Because what is a quarter? 25%. What's 25 times four? 100 so it's 100% covering your, your uh, vesture, not 25%, 25, 25, and 25. That's madness, right? Like the Lord said, um, he would scatter us into corners. Deuteronomy 32 and 26. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. All right, so we're scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. All right, so now I want to kind of get into what I really, I spent a lot of time on that, but that's the spirit, man. Huh? You got to go over these diverse laws. WFI Law School, Deuteronomy 22 and 13. Now we're dealing with sexual misconduct. You got sexual misdemeanor. There's a lot of sexual crimes in America. Sodomy is a crime. Uh, sexual assault. Uh, and there's different degrees of sexual assault, uh, uh, rape, molestation, um, all, all types of uh, uh, things, man. All right, let's see if I can we'll pull up a list of this. Right, sexual assault. You see, Esau will give you a misdemeanor. Right, it has to be egregious. So we got to know how to conduct ourselves, man. You got people drugging people. You got these uh, uh athletes and strange guys putting pills and people drink. Oh, I'm gonna get me a wife today. Hey, I knew a brother. This brother said, "Hey, look, man." He went to this event and he started grabbing up on all of the women. They said, get off of me, get off of me. He said, no, I'm going to get me a wife today. You know, I don't care about none of that. So he started grabbing up the woman. The woman started running around. He started chasing. Them. So we got we to gotta know how to conduct ourselves, man. We gotta, you got a lot of madness going on in the nation. So that's what Deuteronomy 22, it goes into, they say laws of morality. But really how a man deals with his wife how a man should go about marriage, the penalties uh, of sexual misconduct, right? When you deal with a woman, all of this is documented. All right, this is uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22 and 13. If a man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her. Now go in unto her meaning you lay down with her. Lay down with her doesn't mean y'all are uh, spending the night, right? As best friends, lay down meaning you have sex with her, all right? So a man might lay down with a woman, he might hate her, man. You know? Because he might have seen something in this woman that he, he didn't know existed. Right? He might have found out that, you know, a process of time that, hey, look, you know, she has bad hygiene. Hey, look, you know, she she she's not really cooking. You know, I thought how I thought she was. Hey, she's slothful. Hey, she she can't, she she keep running her mouth, she keep talking back. I can't believe I laid with this woman. So then he's going to try to get out of this marriage. But he's not going to do it the right way. Right? Or he could lay down with this woman and hate her because it was told him that he's a virgin, that she's a virgin. 
See, men in the ancient world married virgins. And that's really what this is going into. You might lay down with a woman, and you thought she was a virgin, but she's not a virgin. Now you can say, well, how do you know? You know, well, look, that, that's not what this lesson is about. Right? He laid down with this woman. He found out that she wasn't a virgin. Now he's going to be mad. He's going to be upset. He's he's going he's going to be heated, man. That's like you and I hate the I don't want to say hate, but you know just the example I could think of off the top of the head, right? Um, just like you buying a car, right? You spend you know twenty thousand dollars. 50,000, whatever much on a car. And a salesman said, look, it's a new car. You know, it's, it's nobody's ever driven it off the lot, right? I mean, uh, fresh seats, you know, uh, zero miles on it, right? Zero miles. It's a fresh car, new engine, new transmission, straight from the factory. Never been touched before. You're the first one to touch the handle, first one to adjust the mirrors. First one to put your seat back. First one to kind of get in that thing and press the, the, the radio and the buttons. You're the first one to drive it and see how I feel. Now imagine you're told that. And you say, damn, that sounds good. I'll pay $100,000 for this car. You give the guy the cash, right? He takes that money and he gives you a car. But when you get in the car, you, you, you start the, the gas or start the car, whatever, you turn, the, you know, the ignition and whatnot. And you look at the damn uh, um, odometer and it says 200,000 miles on it. You try to put your seat back and, and, and the seat gets stuck. You look at the passenger seat and it stains all in the passenger seat. You try to, you know, press the um, rooftop button for it to go back and then the damn glass break. And you're going to be mad. You're going to be upset. I paid big time, top notch money for this car and I'm not getting what I paid for. So the same thing, a man might pay for a virgin. Yes, men pay for wives. It's called a bride price. It's called a dowry. All right, let's pull that up. Let's go to um, Genesis. All right, chapter 34. Men pay for their wives. They want to know I saw at the club. Well, I seen at the bus stop, right? And I was just getting off of work and I kind of saw her and I'm like, man, that's some, man, who, who is that? Right? Who, who is that over there? This is um Genesis chapter 34 and verse, right? Salakia. So This is Genesis chapter 34 and verse, uh, bear with me. Let's start at, I'm chop up. Bear with me. Okay, this is what Dinah Dinah uh, uh, is the daughter of Jacob, right? Dinah's the daughter of Jacob. Now, Dinah got snatched up against her will by Shechem, a Canaanite, right? And he actually uh, raped this woman, took her against her will. Now, here's what he said. This is Genesis chapter 34 and verse 11. So he grabbed this woman up and he took her against his will, against her will, raped her, and then he wants to go back to Jacob and say, hey, look, I messed up. Let's talk about it, though. Yeah, I took your daughter, I raped her, but I, look, let me let me pay for her now. Right? Genesis chapter 34 and 11. And, that, and that's evil. You can't do that. You can't break into a car lot, steal a car, bring the car back, and say, look, can I buy the car? That's out of order. And Shechem said unto her father and to her brethren, let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me, I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift. 
and I will give according as ye shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. Right? So the Lord said, ask me never so much dowry and what? And gift. All right? A dowry is a price that you have to pay for a, a virgin. See, see that? Purchase price for a wife. Wedding money. So they don't do that now, ma. Right? You don't go to the father and say, look, you know, I'm, I'm interested in your daughter. And then you and the father sit down and talk about that and say, well, hey, look, well, she's worth, you know, $200,000. And you got to make that decision and say, hey, look, is it worth it? Right? Do, you know, do I have 200000 He might say, I want you on a payment plan. You know, I want $12,000, you know, every year. And you got you to... Gotta, Ask yourself, hey, look, can I do this? Do I love this woman that much? Is it worth it? So, again, in this society now, you got men just getting on one knee. You go to the courthouse. You go to Vegas. You get married in Vegas. People are eloping. Fathers were talking to ancient world. Samson did that with his father. He said, give me this uh, woman a wife. And his father got him. said, well, what the hell are you thinking about? Get an Israelite woman. Why do you want a Philistine? Abraham got a wife for his son, Isaac. Isaac met that woman day one. And Abraham paid a dowry for Rebecca. He gave her uh, uh, bracelets and jewels and, and all types of um, expensive uh, material. Right? Let me jump. I'm not going to read this whole account. Right? But this is Genesis. I'm going to jump up. Right? Chapter... Uh, 24 and verse 1. Actually, I'm going to get straight to the point. And verse 4. But thou, this is what Abraham told his servant, shall go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So Isaac didn't have a say so. Now Isaac could have said, well, what about this woman right here? I like this woman. You know, she, she, she's from here. And, hey, and his father don't care. We have strong communities and strong fathers in the ancient where they said, no, I know what's best for my son. It's called an arranged marriage. They still do it to this day in certain parts of the Eastern world. That's a Semitic marriage, an arranged marriage. So they would actually travel and go get this wife, right? And they actually gave uh, gifts. Let, let me jump down. Because when he met Rebecca, he actually gave her bracelets, right? Verse 22. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of a half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands and 10 shekels weight of gold. So that's what Abraham paid for, man. Jewelry, gold, earrings. And, and that was enough. Right. And he did these things and brought them to uh, when you read her father, Bethuel and Laban. Right. This verse 30. And it came to pass when he. Right. Meaning the brother Laban saw the earring and bracelets upon his sister's hand. I mean, he saw her decked out. And when he heard the words of Rebecca, his sister, saying, thus spake the man unto me. That it came into the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. Right. So Laban saw that money, and his eyes got big. Say, hey, look, why don't you come inside? Let's talk. The point of the matter is, Abraham gave bracelets, jewels, gold, that Rebekah may become the wife of his son Isaac. That's a dowry, a, a price he paid. Nowadays, when the ancient world, uh, most women were virgins. If you wasn't a virgin, it'd be strange to you. It was strange for a woman not to be a virgin. Men wasn't getting the women that they laid down with 10 men, 20 men. Right? I'm the, this is this is just it is what it is. Now you can it is what it is. This is how this is how it worked, man. Right? It wasn't getting with a, a woman that had uh, four husbands, man. A, a, a man of wisdom said, hold on now. 
I'm getting me a virgin. Right? That was that was a high thing back then. And that's a thing common amongst Jake, sexual misconduct, man. I don't have to tell him how many men I laid down with. That's none of his business. Well, you shouldn't have been laid down with all these men anyway, man. Right? Well, well, I, I'm sexual, uh, what they call it, the sexual liberation. I ain't laid down with nobody. So this is this is an evil society. I have never done this before. Right? I'm not like them. I'm not like these other girls. There's all types of evil in this earth, man. That Jake, so Jake, Jake, you have a lot of, and Eve, you have a lot of sexual misconduct going on, man. You're laying down, like, yeah, like they said, I was going through my um, HOE phase, the brother said. Right? And that's the normal thing. Oh, I just went through my whole phase. Okay, from the age of 18, when you were uh, a senior in high school, a freshman in college, to maybe your senior year in college, you could, you, you know, you just do what you want to do. Oh, that was my experimental stage. My different phase. Now I'm ready to settle down. Eve, you're 35 years old. You done been with 19 different men. Now you're ready to settle down. So, you know, and it, that still plays a role today because our men still have that ancient world. Well, some men, but some one man is going to look at that and say, oh, hell no. This is damaged goods. You know, when a woman lays down with multiple men, she carries the, the, the um, spirit of those men, right? It's, it sticks to it. Let's see if I can get that. Uh, I'm trying to see if I could type this in the right way. Um, right? I'm not sure if I'm typing it. Oh, here it is. You see that? And now they say it's false. Right? But now they say women carry DNA of all their um, sex partners that they had, man, that they dealt with. See, a woman is naturally made to be with one man. Because when a woman is with multiple men, they carry on the spirit of those different men. When a man put, and this is uh, the ancient word, this is what the lessons really, you know, we're going into, man. Huh? Diverse law, sexual misconduct, this is not to offend anybody. This is not to, you know, this it is what it is. It's in the Bible. Because a man will hate a woman that's not a virgin. And we have to go back into how to be pure, upright men and women. It is what it is, right? So if a man puts his seed inside of a woman, that woman takes on that spirit of that man. And that's just, is, it is what it is. And she takes on his name. She becomes a possession to that man. Her name was Mrs. Jones and his name was Mr. Smith. She is now Mrs. Smith. She takes on his name. She takes on his image. She will even start picking up his slang and his lingo. She will start putting his sweater on his, his hoodie, his button ups. Right? You know, she'll start eating the food that he eats. Next thing you know, she's rooting for the Lakers. She's eating a bowl of, of damn pretzels, saying, shoot the shot. She picks on his favorite team. Right? She picks on his spirit. She begins, her mind begins to be molded like unto him. But when a woman lays down with seven different men, she has all these seven different spirits on her, man. Huh? So a woman is created to be with one man, and men will pay a dowry for one woman. Now, men can have more than one wife, but he will pay a dowry to that father. And that father had to make sure his woman stayed a virgin. Like the brother said, there was no, or sister, there was no baby mothers. What is, what is the true definition of a baby mother? Well, a, a baby mother is a, a woman who has children by a man that they are no longer with. They're no longer uh, uh, in a cohabitable relationship. I Meaning this guy might live in D.C., right? And she might live somewhere in Baltimore. 
that's a baby mama. They don't really have a relationship, but they kind of talk off and on. Sometimes they don't talk. They say, you know, drop the kids off, don't drop the kids off. Sometimes I don't see you no more. I got baby. And Jake, you got like five baby mothers. Let me see if baby mothers in the Bible. Baby, baby mother. Look at this madness. There is no baby mothers. Okay, let's try baby father. That's my baby father. Or they say baby daddy. That's madness, man. You got baby mothers in Israel. Well, I'm from the tribe of Judah. I'm a baby mother. Yeah, my husband, he's in this congregation. He got me pregnant, but we still talk. I mean, you know, I see him on a Shabbat, but not on the Passover. Right? So, you you know, we, we got to get back, get our spirits back right. So let's go back to this. So a man would pay a dowry. Uh, Abraham paid a dowry. We read in Genesis that Hamor said, ask me, uh, uh, what do you want? I'll pay you a dowry or a gift for your daughter. All right. So let's go back to this. Even King Saul. Right. In first Samuel. Lead us to 18 chapter. 18 to verse 24. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, on this matter spake David. And Saul said, thus shall ye say to David. The king desireth not any dowry. Because Saul wanted to give his daughter to David as a trap. He said, I don't want you to pay for it. I know that's the norm, but don't do it. I don't want money. Here's what I want. But a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So a father might say, look, I need to go kill these guys, right? The enemy. Slay this heathen. And battle. Show yourself valiant in war and you can have my daughter. Caleb did that. Caleb told Israel, he said, hey, look, whoever can slay these giants and these Africans out here in, in Mount Hebron or whatnot, you can have my daughter. Right? And Othaniel did it. And he was able to take Caleb's daughter to be his wife. So you could also have that in the ancient where the man could, could show himself valiant in war and the father might say, yeah, that, that shows like, that this man is worth. You can have my daughter. She'll be protected under you. You have a strong mind, a warrior mentality. You're mature, right? You could deal with adversity. So th this is how things worked. So a man might lay down with a woman and find out that she's not a virgin. What will happen? And give Deuteronomy 22 and 14, and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman. And when I came to her, I found her not a maid, right? So he might, this woman actually probably couldn't have been a virgin at times. Because you might have laid with a woman and said, damn, I thought she was going to be a virgin. She wasn't a virgin. Or you might lay with a woman that was a virgin, but then lie and say she wasn't. Now, why would he do that? Why would a man lay with a woman that is a virgin and then lie and say she wasn't? Because he paid top dollar and he want his money back. He want, he want the, uh, what they call it, the, um, he want to have his cake and eat it too. He want to deal with this woman and get a refund. Right? But you can't do that, man. Jake, you do that when you when you get clothes and stuff. I'm going to just, I'm going to buy it. But you know you really want to turn it back. Return it. I'm going to just wear it for today. Then you turn, I didn't really like this. It didn't really, you know, fit the theme. You already wore it, man. You kind of put the receipt back and put it back and tie it and put the tag kind of back and make it look kind of nice and put the hangers. You keep the hangers you got from the store. Right? You put it back in the box and you return it as if nothing really happened. You don't wore this outfit all up and down this weekend. But now you're bringing it back 
to the, to the cashier or, or uh, a customer service, I didn't really like this. So you can get your money back, man. This is what Jake would do with women. Think about that with women. They would lay down with a woman and then come back and say, hold on, this, ah, that wasn't it. Let me get my money back, man. I paid for a burger. She wanted a burger. And he could be lying. He could be a straight outright nigga and be lying on this woman's name. So now we got a big, this is a big deal going on. Everybody's going to hear about this, man. You know, Israel like to talk. Oh, I heard that brother so-and-so, his daughter wasn't a virgin. Well, I heard that she was, and, and, and this becomes a controversy in the land. So now we got to kind of escalate this matter. So let's read on. What happens next? Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city and the gate. So they now they have to say, well, hold on, this guy's lying. This, this brother's lying. He know very well my daughter was a virgin. In fact, here's the proof. The proof is what? The tokens of the damsel's virginity. Meaning the sign that she was a virgin. What is, what is the token of a damsel's virginity? Blood. When you lay down with a virgin, hymen breaks, blood comes forth. That blood shows the fact that she was a virgin. And the parents, the father and mother, would actually take that as insurance. They would take those sheets. Like you say, that's gross. I don't get it. Well, this is the ancient mind. Right? Life was different back then. This is the ancient father, not the, not the American man. They would take this for insurance. Just in case somebody would lie on their daughter. And they would actually celebrate. They would bring the sheets out and say, hey, look, they're, they're, you know, they consummated the marriage. They're taking it, put it in the box or put it where it had to go. And they would bring it to the elders and say, hold on, well, if my daughter wasn't a virgin, what are these sheets? Whose blood is this? And that guy is going to put his head down. The man who lied, he's going to put his head down because he got caught. Now, there's a video. I believe Yaradon put it one time. I believe it was in East India, somewhere in, in the land of um of the amongst the Elamites. I may not be able to find it, but there was a video and they actually celebrated. Right, I may not be able to find it. But they came out with the um the parents after they were done, brought forth the tokens of the virginity. All right, but that's the point. So they would bring that out to the elders. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hated her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid. And yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they spread the cloth before the elders of the city. Right, and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. So they say, look, he lied on my daughter. Here's the sheets to prove it. And they'll spread those sheets for the elders of the city. And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. But then they'll get on him. They might, you know, point at, at his face. They might, you know, yoke him up a little bit. They might yell at him in public. They'll make this guy public disgrace. And, and this is something that the entire city saw. Old city would come out and look at this guy. Say, this guy, he ain't right. He lied on this, this virgin. What kind of man is this? What kind of Israelite is this, man? Lying on his father's house. Because remember, this is a big deal, right? If the father actually did this, the father, he'll uh, have a bad name. Known for giving, selling women to men that really wasn't virgins. Like a shady car salesman. Nobody likes a shady car salesman. People fight guys like that, right? In the world. You you, you got a guy kind of lying about what he's selling. Oh man, you know, I'm you good with me, man. I look out for you because you know I, I wouldn't normally do this for everybody, but I do it for you. We all know that kind of salesman, right? You know, man, it's top notch, man. This car, this joint runs smooth. 
Yeah, just need a little bit of little bit of you know oil change. Knowing damn well that car about to break down. Nobody wants to deal with a man like that. And nobody wants to deal with a father who's giving his daughters away, lying, saying that they're virgins and they're not really virgins. That's why the elders are going to take that man and chastise him. And not only, not only that, it says, and they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver and give them unto the father of the damsel because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. And his God get punished. First, he get publicly disgraced and chastised, and he got to pay 100 shekels of silver. Why does he have to pay 100 shekels? Because really, 50 shekels is the price of a virgin. That's like the standard price. So he has to double down because he lied. When you jump to Deuteronomy 22 and I believe that's 29, right? It reads, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver. And she shall be his wife because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. So he has to pay 50 shekels of silver. That's the standard price. But this man that lied and brought his brother's name down and a virgin's name down, guess what, bro? He has to pay 50, I mean, 100 shekels of silver. And that's a lot of money back then. That's big money. That's well over, you know, uh, uh, I believe over $1,300, $1,400 now, I could, you know, somewhere around that. Right, I believe 30 shekels is around six hundred dollars. Right, so this is any maybe over two grand. He gotta pay. And another punishment is that he may not put her away all his days. That's a punishment. Now you can say, Well, how is that a punishment? Because in the ancient world, you can put away your wife for any cause. But now he got to deal with it. All right. Verse 20. But if this thing be true and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, let's say he laid down with this woman and she really wasn't a virgin. What would happen? Then they should bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she died. Because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. So should thou put evil away from among you. So this woman really probably wasn't a virgin. Now he would know because there wouldn't be any blood right there. And he'll be mad, man. Right? right? And she will, she, she'll make an excuse. Well, you know, uh, every woman's different. I got these women back then making an excuse. Right? Every woman's different. Right? You don't want to hear that, man. You got to give it time. Give it a few days. Yeah, yeah. I just got off my, my flower not too long ago. That's why there's no blood. Right? Well, I, my, I've been sick. My stomach been hurting. Hey, this guy, don't want to hear that, man. If it ain't no blood, he don't care about what you got to say. Now, the simple man, he'll believe that. Well, yeah, maybe you're right. Yeah, well, there's no blood on this. There ain't no, well, maybe, you know, and see what you're saying. Right, and he and she got him. Huh? She really done laid down with five other men. But if this guy don't see no blood on the sheets, it's a problem. See, right now we're so destroyed with sexual misconduct; it's not a problem to men. It's normal. In fact, if you lay down with a woman and you see blood, you'll freak out. Oh, what's going on? Or Jake. Not to take it there, but Jake, you do all types of evil things, man. You lay down with a woman on her uh, uh, flower, man. We, they was doing that in the ancient world. Let me pull that up. Right? That's in Ezekiel. I believe that's in Ezekiel. So they, they was doing that, man. Let's see, I believe that was Ezekiel. Right. First, let me get the law. 
but her flowers be upon him. Let me get that. Uh -huh. Right, that's in Leviticus, the 15 chapter, but there's one in Ezekiel. I have to find it, right? First, let's go to Leviticus chapter 15, right? This Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 24. And if any man lie with her at all and her flowers be upon him, he should be unclean seven days and all the bed where on he lies shall be unclean. So the Lord says a man shouldn't be lying with a woman with her flowers. Her flowers is her, what they call her cycle. Right? You can't do that. Right? But that's what Jake, Jake, you do all types of, Jake, you do all types of vile things. Then you got brothers going to Hebrews chapter 13 and 4 and say, well, I could do what I want to do, the bad undefiled. That's not what that means. Hebrews 13 and 4 does not mean you could, you could just do God knows what. Right? If a brother put that scripture to justify some lewd Edomite behavior, then, then the most high sees that, man. Right? So you can't lay down with a woman with her flower or her flower. All the time you should lay down with a woman and there should be blood there is if she's a virgin. Okay? That's how Jake, you got all types of um sexually transmitted disease. The HIV rate, STIs. The average Jake has had at least one sexually transmitted disease. And it was between you were 17 and 22. Right? You didn't have had chlamydia. You probably had, you know, syphilis. You probably had, uh, um, uh, what's that other one? Uh, maybe gonorrhea, you know? Maybe you had you know, uh, herpes or you had it. So, Jake, you, you get these things because that's judgment from the most high. Those are our sins, man. And, and that's the penalty for your sin. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13 and 4. Right? Hebrews chapter 13 and 4. Everything's not permissible, man. We have to understand that we're a godly people. A clean, righteous people. There's, I'm not going to go all into detail about what Jake is into now, right? Because I want to, you know, we want to keep this spiritual. But you, certain things that that we're hearing now is just outright evil, huh? And I'm sure you 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 can fill in the blanks. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We have to do things according to what's righteous, man. Huh? We're so perverted by this world, we do anything, man. Huh? All right, so we have laws to teach us how to govern our people as a nation, right? What's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13 and 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, the most high will judge. So what does it mean marriage is honorable in all? It means this is the highest level of a relationship between a man and a woman, right? In all things, marriage has honor. It's over a boyfriend and girlfriend, over a friend with benefits, over a, a, a buddy, a you-know-what buddy, over a, 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 a prostitute-client relationship, right? It, it's, it tops all of that, man. You got Jake swinging, you got swingers, you got you got uh, freakism, you got baby fathers, you got baby mothers, you got jump offs, you got side pieces, you got all types of madness. But marriage is honorable and all. When a righteous man proves a righteous woman and that righteous woman proves a righteous man and that woman takes her time and that man takes his time and they get to be on one accord and learn one another and not be rushing or hasty to be in bed with one another, she understands the laws of marriage and what the Most High expects out of a woman. He understands the laws of marriage and what the Most High expects out of a man. Right? A, a, uh, um, Lord willing, their fathers are involved. He meets her father. She meets his parents. 
the families get together, the families get to know one another, because marriage is about not just sex, it's about the nation. It's about families coming together. This father and his family, and this father and his family, they become close by law. That's why his father becomes her father in what? In law. And his mother becomes her mother in law. According to law, he has to deal with her as the manner of daughters. So marriage is honorable. It builds a nation. It builds up children. It builds up family structures. It builds up communities. And the bed undefiled. The bed undefiled is also honorable. So there's two types of beds. You got an undefiled bed. You got a defiled bed. An undefiled bed is when a man lays down with his wife. That's undefiled. A defiled bed is a man laying down with someone else's wife. A woman laying down with another man. Lewd sexual acts going on in the bed. That's a defiled bed. You land down with a woman on her flowers. That's a defiled bed. That's a filthy, nasty bed. You not going through the ceremonial rites of cleaning the sheets and, and cleaning the, 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 all of that after you lay down with your woman. That's a defiled bed. Bringing a prostitute in at some motel, laying down with her for $50 an hour is a defiled bed. You sneaking a man in while your husband at work is at work and y'all and he deal with you in the bed and he duck off and then he come in that same bed and lay down there. That's a defiled bed. There's a lot of defiled beds going. There's a lot of filthy beds. Eve, you know, got a mattress on the floor somewhere in some damn studio apartment. She she met some guy at the club. He come in and they deal with her, her stained up mattress on the floor. That's a defiled bed, man. You know? It's a lot of lootness going on. Let's get an example of a, of a defiled bed. Let's go to the Book of Wisdom of Solomon. So we got to, all this sexual misconduct has to stop amongst our people, man. Right? Hebrews chapter 13, um, Slaki, I want chapter yeah, 3, Slaki. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 16. As for the children of adulterers, so adultery would be in an, unra in an unrighteous bed. As for the children of adulterers, they shall not come to their perfection. And the seed of an unrighteous bed shall be rooted out. Right? So if you have an unrighteous bed, your children are going to be rooted out. That's how serious it is. So this verse does not mean you can do God knows what in the bed. With a bed and defiled, huh? No, that, that that means that you land down with your woman is you land down with that woman is your wife. That's what that means. It doesn't mean that you could take this out and use this and take this out of a box and spin it and press this on switch and right use this and take this thing and uh, attach it to this and you got a four piece set and use this and screw this on top and take this but all types of Bugged out stuff, man. Remember, um, Esau's a fornicator. He's the lewd man. He, he's the perverse man. Who wants to pervert our mind. He's the one that has pornography out there. Right? He's the one that has uh, uh, all of this madness out there. The over, uh, pretty much play with your, your, your stimulus, man. See, Jake, you, you, you grow up in a sexual perverse society, man, where things that are supposed to be sacred and holy and, and, and intimate and personal are now just normal and public. You know, you see women out here now, I mean, there was a time in the ancient world when a man didn't see a woman uh, naked to the day he laid down with her. The day that he got married was the very first time he saw a woman naked. Right? Now you see these women naked all the time. Man. I mean, they're on TV, magazines, they're at Walmart. They're out. I mean, 
They're all out, man. You have women with short, I mean, so short, short, uh, short shorts on and, you know, body hanging out and cleavage out. And, you know, it, it, it does something to our nation, man. It puts a spirit on them in. See, that's why marriage has lasted longer in the ancient world, too, man. Because of the, for lack of better terms, that desire and stimulus that you had with that wife. But when you've been, you know, seen all of the women naked and you've been desensitized to all of that, and it causes all types of confusion. And same thing with a woman. So now you got a woman that laid down with 10 men. So now when she get married, she's not even satisfied with her husband because she's comparing her husband's uh, uh, um, performance with men that she's been with in her mind. When all she's supposed to know is one man. You're not like real. Right? You're not like uh, Tony. See, James, James, get on James level. So this is madness. Sexual immorality and sexual misconduct destroys us, man. But you have laws on how to govern that. Laws on how to govern it. Now she's comparing you to other men. When you get into it, that's what, and she throw that out there. That's why you have a, you know what, man? Well, she she shouldn't even know that because she should have been with one man from the beginning of her inception to the day she died. So she should have no idea about anything like that, man. But that's just perverse, lewd society. All right, let's get that. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 and 16. Right, Hebrews chapter 12. So there's a lot of sexual misconduct going on. And we have to come back to the law and understand what true marriage is and understand what righteousness is and how a man should deal with a woman. All right, this is a bugged out, perverted kingdom. Hebrews chapter 12 and 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, for ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So you have fornication going on. Now you look up the root word or the, the Greek word for fornication. What is it? Pornos. Right? Pornos. That is the Greek word for fornication. Let's pull this up. And we always go into it. Fornication is adultery fornication is a man laying down with a beast or a woman laying down with a beast or uh, whatever a man with a man sodomy right a woman with a woman what they call a uh, lesbianism um uh, uh, incest right all of that is pornos and they show all of that in pornos man all them different lewd things so it says a man who prostitutes. So it's not just a man prostitute. Right? But that is that is a form of fornication. Gigolos, prostitutes, a man who indulges in unlawful sexual intercourse, a fornicator. Right? A fornicator. So let's go back to this. So fornication is heavy. And Esau is being called a fornicator. Because he's the one that promotes all matter of lewdness on our people. All matter of madness. All right, so let's go back. Let's go back to this. Let's go back to Hebrews, the 13th chapter. I see how much time I'm at. I'm sure I'm going over time. All right, that's all right. All right, Hebrews 13 and 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed of the foul, but whoremongers and adulterers the most I will judge. And that's why people get STDs. That's why people die when they're laying down with another man's wife and the husband come in and blow their brains out or shoot them. Right? When they come in with a, with a 32 and shoot them in the back of the neck as they catch their wife laying down with a man. That's judgment. That's why women get pregnant and they lose their baby. Because that baby is a baby out of wedlock. A baby that's a baby of adultery. Stillborn. Marriages don't last. Children dying. 
This is the uh, the judgment upon Jacob for sexual misconduct and morality, man. You're popping Esau is giving you pills. You're popping pills and you're freaking off. And he got a. This is a nasty kingdom, man. Right? Uh, 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 Esau tells you got to use contraceptives with your wife. You got people getting a um, two. You got Eve getting a tubes tied. Sarah would not get a damn tubes tied. Man. Rebecca, Rachel, I ain't having no babies, but I got my tubes tied. When I'm paying top, how much does it cost to get your tubes tied? Man? You're selling your food stamps, right? Your food stamp card, your EBT card, bridge card, whatever you call it, uh, to get tubes tied. Then they want to get them untied. Look at this, right? For patients not covered, hold on, by health insurance, tubal ligation typically costs between fifteen to seventeen thousand dollars. All right, so th this is what Jake is doing, man. Look at this, Planned Parenthood. They say is they do it for free. Let you be a so-called black Hispanic or Native American woman. They go, hey, look, hey, hey you don't need no insurance. They're going to jump out that chair and say, let's get a tube tied. Let you be a so-called black woman. A white woman, they want your insurance. You got to fill out 10 sheets of paper, go through a year-long trial process and waiting process because they want these white women to have children. They, they don't. You can't get your tube tied as a so-called white woman because you have a negative birth rate and a declining birth rate. So they're going to put you through loops and through holes for you as a devil they need more devils. They, they don't want you to get your tubes out. But let you be a so-called black woman. It's free. On the house. On me. And they'll give you a gift bag afterwards. And they do that. They give me these women gift bags, man. Tell your cousins about me. And that white woman, tell Keisha about me. Yeah, we saw Rel and Keisha last week when they got that abortion. We saw Tammy and Tiffany when they came back and they got their tubes tied. And your auntie was just here last year, man. Tell I said, how's the recovery going? This is the evil and the perversion of our kingdom that we live in, man. This filthy, strange land. Like I tell you in Baruch, how do we become waxing old in a strange land? Did you get that in Baruch? Then you got Jake getting a, um, what they call it, um, vasectomy. But I'm thinking that a, it's another thing. They get clipped. You get snipped. You got these guys at the barbecue flipping the burger talking about, hey, I got snipped. When are you getting snipped, Brad? Oh, I just got snipped. Oh, it's the old lady. She wanted me to get clipped. You know, last year, I finally did it. And they take the corona and bud light and toast to no kids, man, at the backyard cookout. Brad and Lance. You know? As those little eat my kids uh, uh, play around, man, and, and, and do God knows what in the dark. This is Baruch chapter 3 and 9. How happened it, Israel, that thou art in thine enemy's land? How did you end up in a perverse, sexually strange kingdom? But all manner of lewdness going on, man. Esau throwing subliminal messages, trying to arouse you, desensitize you. Right, you go on social media, it's nothing but but lewdness on there. Right? It's nothing but but freakism on the internet. How did this happen? How did you end up in a perverse kingdom? When you once knew the laws, like I said, with the only time a woman saw a man, right, uh, uh um sexually is when she laid down with him. And she didn't lay down with any other man. Only time a man saw a woman in her, her nakedness is when he, he laid down with her. Nobody else saw her. Nobody else touched that woman but him. Now well, you got Jake with herpes. You know? Stuff that don't go away. Stuff that, oh, it's a flare-up. It's just a flare-up. It's just a sore, cold sore. It's just a, right? And he got that, um, put the lip balm on. It's just a flare-up. Right? How happened it, Israel, that thou art in thine enemy's land, that thou art waxing old in a strange country 
that thou art defiled with the dead. How did you become defiled with the dead? How did you end up here, bro? What happened to our 14 day wedding feast? What happened to when you laid down with a when you laid down with a woman and then you had 30 days off of work after you laid down with that woman to cheer up your wife? What happened to that, bro? Hell, you be Esau won't even give you no damn paternity leave. Maternity leave, man. You gotta work to the day you die. How did you end up in a strange land with pornography, masturbation, prostitutes, subliminal messages, witchcraft, and lewdness? You know, even in this society, there are uh, uh, we uh, we pulled that up before. They even show you in the Disney Channel, all these cartoons, they create these shapes that look like uh, uh, genitals and. All types of stuff, man. Them old cartoons to train the chil the children's mind to be sexually deviant. I'm not going to pull it up. You can look it up on your own after the Sabbath, man. With discretion, of course. They show you all of that stuff. They train up the children's mind as they watch these shows and cartoons to be sexually deviant. And it's, it's to play on their mind. So they grow up to be per perverts. Then they teach you sexual education when you Put them in their schools. Today, class, we're going to learn about sex ed. You got some old creepy white man getting getting riled up as he talks to your your uh, nine year old son about what a man's ride does, man. So this is a perverse, filthy, vile kingdom. So let's go back to this. Right, we gotta put the and the Lord said, Hey, when this woman did this, she lied about being a virgin, going back to the point. The Lord said, You gotta put away evil from among you. Right? There's another thing I want to go into about the bed being defiled, right? Let's go to Leviticus, the 15th chapter. See, they say cleansing unhealthiness. Well, these are actual laws about how to clean yourself, right? And this could defile your bed as well. Just Leviticus chapter 15 and 16. And if any man's seed of copulation go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh in water and be unclean until the even. So this, if your sperm comes out of you, right? Guess what? You're unclean. You got to wash all your flesh. Not all your flesh in water. They're not doing that in the world. It's not in the sex ed classes. They're teaching your children. You're probably shaking people's hand at work. You know, in an interview or you're meeting guys or, or you know, co-workers, you got to shake their hand, man. You think they're keeping that law? So you, this is, like I said, this is the, a defiled place. They, We don't even want to imagine what these nations are into, man. So you shake their hand, like, good morning, you know, how you doing, sir? Right, you know, I'm here for the interview. Some old white guy, you know, he's not keeping his commandment. He probably got done dealing with a beast or another man or some little girl, huh? And now you're unclean. All right, let's read on. And every garment and every skin we're on is the seed of copulation shall be washed with water and be unclean until the even. Now that cuts, you know, men that say you got sex on the Sabbath. How can you have sex on the Sabbath if before the sun goes down, you got to wash your sheets? And wash your clothes, right? That's labor. That's work. So how are you going to uh, have a holy convocation on a Shabbat and you got to wash your sheets with water at the same time and you are clean, but you can have sex on the Sabbath. That is madness. So wherever uh, you lay down your woman and that seed goes out and that, that them sheets are unclean. Now you can say, well, look, we, we, we was only in this area. Well, it ain't about what area you was in. It's the sheets. Everything is unclean. You got to take that and you got to wash it. Or that bed becomes defiled, right? And the spirit's all in the house now. And you're unclean until the even. I mean, when that sun go down, okay, now you're clean. And you got to keep that commandment. Don't be vile. Right? Don't be vile. We're a clean people. Okay? Cleanse yourself, man. Wash yourself. Take care of your hygiene is in the Bible, huh? Right? Let's read on. The woman 
right? Also with whom man shall lie with seed of copulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the even. So now the woman, she has to uh, bathe herself, right? And they, and the man has to bathe himself. And she'll be unclean until the even, right? She can't just sit there as she, after she laid down with a man and walk around as if nothing happened. And this cuts the fact that you could use uh, a condom with your wife. They got female condoms. Otherwise, you wouldn't have laws for a man's seed going into his woman because a contraceptive blocks the seed. Then you got plan B's, right? So these are uh, uh, vile things. A husband and a wife should not be dealing with contraceptives. Birth control is wicked and evil, according to the Bible. I'm on my birth control. I'm on my BC. I don't want to get pregnant right now. Did you take your pill? Then you got a man finding out that she didn't take the pills. He get mad. What are you doing? You're trying to trap me. You didn't take your Monday through Friday pill. And it's a big argument because she's not really taking her pills. Well, I don't want to take the pills because it makes me feel sad. You know, it makes me gain weight. It makes my hormones do this. Well, no, nobody should be taking the so-called white man's pills anyway. Man. That's sexual misconduct. Right? All of it, the Lord said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. How are you going to be fruitful and multiply if you're the ones using the things that Esau has given you to stop you from having birth? It's enough already that he's trying to sterilize the woman and has Planned Parenthood and sterilize the men with the food and the, and the air and the water. You're adding more to it, man. Well, I don't know. I don't. I think I only want to have two kids. Well, it's not up to you, huh? It's not up to you. Well, how many children you want to have? It's up to you. How will shot? Well, I don't know if I'm ready. I'm still trying to look and save up for a job because uh, if I have a child now, then I'm not going to uh, be able to afford uh, diapers and pampers because I only work. Hey, look, brother, you worried about the wrong thing. The most I opened up the womb and the most I shut the womb. You can't trust in a so-called white man, right? Because you can use all of that stuff and your woman still get pregnant, man. Now what? How did this happen? You was on birth control and I used the condom and you had this and that. And how did you get pregnant? Because it's not up to the so-called white man to give life or death. It's up to you. How about I was shot, right? And, and the Lord said that his seed will be as the stars of heaven. And that's the sand of the sea, you know? Genesis chapter 30 and 1. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, give me children or else I die. So that's how Eve was back then. There was no, I don't want to have a baby. She said, if I don't have a child, hey, look, I'm going to die. That's how bad I want a baby. That's how bad I want a son or a daughter. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, am I in the Most High's stead, who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? He said, I'm not the Most High. I can't force you to get pregnant. I can lay down with you all day, but the Lord got to give you a child. He has to open up your womb. Right? We should stop. We should stop doing this because you might get me pregnant. Right? Oh, you're going to get me pregnant. Well, well look, you should want to get pregnant if you're, if, if you're dealing with a man in righteousness. Got Eve. Stop. You're gonna get me pregnant. Stop. Make sure you do, make sure you do this. Right? Jake, ooh, that was close. I had to. Well, it ain't no, that was close, man. That's that sexual misconduct that you got in this man's society. You're supposed to, hey, look, you laid out with your woman from start to finish. If you got understanding. It ain't no fearing that she's gonna get pregnant and she not. First of all, if you with this woman, you should want her to get pregnant. If you have an ancient mind, and if you in this truth, and if you understand uh, the, uh, who we are as a people, man, did you know that the Mosai said, "Be fruitful and multiply"? All right? 
I'm going to get tested. I, I need to get need to get a pregnancy test. I think, ooh, I think real got me pregnant. Ooh, real did. She talking on the phone with her girlfriends, man. Ooh, girl, you better, you better get rid of that. Don't even tell them. Don't tell them. But I don't have enough money to pay for it. Don't worry. They do it for free. I know this place. They do it for free. I'll go with you. What if you find out? Is real going to be mad? No, no, no. Real ain't going to be mad. A lot of these men, man, they find out. You know, you be getting rid of their babies. They, they, they get mad. They get carnal. You know? And they get emotional. Like I said, you got a lot of hood, hood sexual misconduct going on amongst our people, man. They call it ghetto love. The most I was not dealing with ghetto love. That's an actual thing, man. Oh, that's hood love. That's that's that ghetto love. What is ghetto love? Right? Damn, ghetto love. That's madness, man. Hold on. What is ghetto love? That can... right? Look at this. That kind of love where y'all cut each other's throat at night at the club with your pocket knives, but looking at other people. Then the next morning she's hanging over his shoulders, bragging about how in love they are. Yeah, that's that's that madness. That's that nigga love, man. Huh? All right. Oh, oh, this ghetto love. Look at this. Right? Look at this. See, this is what Jake is into now, bro. You know? Pulling up, you got a damn fitted cap, bandana on, sagging, right? From get get ghetto V. Right? Getovi. I don't know. I don't I don't know this person's name. Now you can say, well, look, not Kwame, that's not their name. You messed up. You know what their name is. So we're not dealing with that, right? I'm not going to play that whole video. We're not going to deal with ghetto love and, and what they got going on, man. Huh? All right? Look at this madness. Look at this. So kiss is big guy. I'm a key out of you. Mama exos the fear. Hell of some of you. I'm all now I could be wrong, but maybe the uh Levites, right? I'm not sure. I don't know, you know, uh, I don't know. All right, so that's that's so again, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but the whoremongers and adulterers, the Most High will judge, man. Right? Oh yeah, I like that. Uh, argue, we argue, then we lay down together, kind of relationship. Ooh, I like when he yell at me. Right? Ooh, that does. Ooh, he, when I go off, I want to go off so he can yell at me. I like when he put me in my place. I'm going to be wicked so he can put me in my place. That's that ghetto love, man. Right? Let's go to this, man. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 6 and 16. Right? Jeremiah chapter 6 and 16. It reads, Thus said the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. So the Lord said, ask for the old ways. Where is the good way and walk therein? The ancient ways of Abraham, the ancient ways of Isaac, the ancient ways of Jacob. Keep the laws, keep the statutes, and keep the commandments of the Most High, man. Right? And I wasn't able to finish Deuteronomy to um, 20 second chapter but i may have to go back into that and deal with um this on uh, this topic man but this has been wfi law school uh sexual misconduct the semitic marriage and the torah most i willing you were edified giving of course all honor and glory to yahweh from yeshua shalom